when we were in Brazil. Someone asked why it was that sitting with a guided meditation got much better results than sitting there and meditating on your own, even in a group, in the presence of the teacher. My answer was basically that the person giving the guided meditation is doing a lot of your work for you. In other words, the instructions are basically what mindfulness should be doing. And so although it may be useful to have a couple guided meditations and have a guided meditation to listen to every now and then, there comes a point where you have to do the work. Nobody else can make you awakened. Someone, someone once asked the Buddha, please remove my doubts. And the Buddha said, I can't remove anybody's doubts. You have to remove your own doubts. So we've got the instructions, and it's up to you to remember the instructions and to carry them out. You focus on the breath. Try to stay with the breath as much as you can. If you need a meditation word to help, use Bhutto, which means awake. Or you can just do in and out. Anything that helps you stay with the breath. And then the more continually you can stay with the breath, the more you begin to notice whether the breath is rough or uneven or it's too long or too short. Well, you can make adjustments. Try to make your attention on the breath steady and constant, and it helps smooth out the breath. And then whether long breathing feels good or short breathing feels good, that's up to you. You're developing not only your mindfulness, i.e. your ability to keep things in mind, but also your powers of judgment. What's working, what's not working, how to compare. The more you meditate, the more you have to learn how to depend on your, your own powers. And this is what the meditation is for, is teaching you how to do that. We talk about how we take refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha on both an internal and an external level. On the external level, we're inspired by the story of the Buddha, inspired by his teachings, inspired by the Dharma, and inspired by the example of the Noble Sangha. We take these people as examples for how we should live. I was saying today in the class, you know, try to live your life in such a way that if people read about your life, they would be inspired. Not that you're showing off, but just keep that in mind, that you're setting an example for others, too, as you act. Because we see the good example that the Buddha has set, the good teachings he's given us, the, the good example of the Noble Sangha. And one way of expressing our gratitude for that is to try to pass on the example. But more important than that is for our own sake, for our own strength so that we can depend on ourselves. We want to take them as an example. Because whether other people are going to take you as an example or not, that doesn't lie within your power. There's no way you can force them. And if, even if they don't take you as an example, your practice is not wasted. Because you've taken care of what your responsibility is. Now the question is, how do you take their example and turn it into a refuge inside. And that's what the teachings on the five strengths are about. Five steps with which you internalize the qualities of the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha and make yourself into your own refuge. All five steps start with heedfulness, or heedfulness underlies all of them all. You realize that if you can't depend on yourself, you're living in a dangerous world. Because even your act of taking refuge in the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha becomes uncertain. Some days you take them as an example, and other days you live as if they never existed. And sometimes the change is not from day to day, but can even be moment from moment. This is scary. So I sense that you've got work to do. There are dangers inside the mind, there are dangers outside, but the ones inside the mind are the important ones. Keep that as your motivation. And then based on that, you develop the five strengths. The first is conviction. Conviction in the Buddha's awakening. 
three knowledges he's gained, and, and most importantly, the, the teaching on karma, that actions have results. And the results depend on the intention that inspires the action and then the skill with which you carry it out. And that you really do have the choice, you have the opportunity to change the way you're acting. You've got to have that conviction that you have it within you. If you see that you're doing something unskillful, you can figure out how to change. It's a possibility. And which means that you're also convinced that you've got it within you to do this. If you don't have that conviction in yourself, in addition to the conviction of the Buddha, the practice is not going to work. You run up against an obstacle and you just run away. As John Lee said, it's like digging down into the ground, and there's gold in the ground, but first you run into a big rock. And some people, when they hit the big rock, they just throw away their shovels and run off. But if you're convinced the gold is there and you can find it, you'll be able to find some way of getting through the rock. Years back when we were getting ready to build the jetty and what Thomas had hit, we had to bring in some people to put some dynamite in the rock in the mountain. And they had no fancy equipment. They had a spike and a hammer, and that was it. And they would go tap, tap, tap on the rock, and then turn the spike a little bit, and they would tap, tap, tap. And I kept thinking to myself, these people will never get anywhere into the rock. Well, sure enough, I came back two hours later, and they'd gotten a couple feet down into the rock, just tap, tap, tap. It was the consistency of their effort that got them through the rock. And it was, of course, they were convinced they had seen in the past that this worked, and so they just kept at it. So you've got to have that kind of conviction. It may not seem that much is changing from day to day, but over time you get deeper and deeper through the rock and to finally get to the point where there is gold on the other side. So conviction is what gives you a sense that your own actions are important, and if there's anywhere where you're unskillful, you have the ability to change it. Building on that is persistence. In other words, the effort to develop what's skillful and abandon what's not. But it's more than just the effort. There's also the motivation. As the Buddha said, an important part of a right effort is generating desire. That's your motivation. You want to keep reminding yourself why you want to do this. You're not doing this because somebody else tells you. This is your own choice. And you choose it not because you can't do anything else. That was another one of the questions that came up in Brazil. They asked, so why did you ordain? What went wrong in your life? And all the monks laughed. And as I answered, it was something that went very right. I found a path that I could really give my whole heart to. And so whatever motivation keeps you on the path, try to develop that. Goodwill is an important one. Goodwill is a strength that you can generate from within. That's your protection. Protects you from yourself, and it protects you often from other people. If you're radiating goodwill, radiating goodwill, people feel less threatened by you. And at the same time, you're less of a threat to yourself. You're much less likely to do harmful things. You remind yourself, okay, I want to act in such a way that harms nobody. And it is possible. And that gives you energy for the practice. You can motivate yourself with heedfulness. You can motivate yourself with a sense of pride that you don't want to stoop to anything low, that you would like to do something noble with your life. That's a perfectly legitimate motivation. There's also a sense of shame that comes with that pride, that you do anything that's beneath you, you would be ashamed even to think about it. So you let it go. So persistence is not just chipping away, chipping away, but it's also giving yourself the juice you need to keep going. 
that you're doing it because you want to do it. Then built on this, you develop the other three strengths. There's mindfulness, the ability to keep something in mind. In this case, it's you keep in mind all the instructions you've got that are helpful for whatever particular part of the practice you're doing at that point. In other words, as you're sitting here meditating, you don't have to think about generosity or, or virtue too much, except when you find that it gives you strength. Your sole concern right now is to remember that you want to be with the breath. And you want to keep reminding yourself to stay here. Now, together with mindfulness, there's alertness. You watch to make sure that you really are doing this. And this is a strength because it keeps you from wandering off and losing your focus. And as you focus in on the breath, you find it does change the quality of the breath. It changes the quality of your experience of the body. It gives rise to a greater sense of well-being. This is how mindfulness begins to shade into the next strength, which is concentration. You stay consistently focused with the breath. The Buddha uses the word ekaka, which can be translated as being one-pointed, but also can mean having one gathering place. Because when he describes concentration, it's a whole body awareness. It's more likely that in this case it means everything in the mind is gathered in one, on one topic, the sense of the body, the sense of the breath as you breathe in and out, and the sense of the more subtle levels of breath energy as they go through the body. And learning to develop a sense of well-being, a sense of refreshment with the breath. When you have this refreshment, that really helps with your conviction and your persistence. It's not the case that with these strengths you'd develop one and then drop it and then go on to the next, or that only the first one helps the second one, which helps the third one. They all help one another. Concentration especially helps with your conviction and with your persistence and with your mindfulness. As the Buddha said, mindfulness doesn't become pure until the fourth jhana, which is a fairly advanced stage of concentration. So as you're focusing here on the breath, once there's a sense of ease, think of that ease spreading through different parts of the body. In the beginning it may not go everywhere, but allow it to flow wherever it can flow easily. And in the same way that opening a channel of water then widens the channel, as more and more water goes through, you find that the breath energy channels get more and more inclusive of different parts of the body the more that the breath runs the body. And as you're doing this, you start developing the final strength, which is discernment. You see what's working and what's not working. It's not just on the basis of what you've heard, but it's on the basis of what you're actually doing. As you learn to adjust things, you begin to see which ways of breathing are more pleasurable, which ways of breathing help you stay with the breath more easily which ways of focusing the mind, and where you focus the mind, these things are going to have an impact. And as you see that connection of cause and effect, that's the beginning of discernment, because then you take that insight and you start applying it to other areas where you're causing suffering. You begin to have a place where you can stand here in the concentration, so you can step back from the other ways of your mind and observe them, and see them more objectively. This particular habit is not useful, I've got to change. Other people seem to be doing better here, okay, can I watch their example without feeling jealous or lessened by the fact that they're more skillful than I am? As John Lee said, his attitude was if he'd go to a new place, he'd look to see what they could do well that he hadn't done well yet, and he wanted to learn from them. If there's some area where he knew more than they did, he would be happy to share his knowledge. But the first point is really important, especially when you're on the path. You want to see, what do other people do more skillfully than I do? Can I learn from their example?
then as you've developed your other strengths, you feel more confident that you can. So it's through these five strengths that you turn yourself into your own refuge. You take the example of the Buddha and it becomes the mold for your own life. So instead of having to depend on someone from outside, you've got the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha inside, where it really counts. And as you make yourself a refuge like this, you find that you can be an external refuge to others. That's how the gift gets passed on. 